On this episode of China Unscripted, China is looking to destroy the U.S.-led international world order. Is war inevitable? Is it even survivable? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Chang, and I'm Matt Ganesha. Joining us today is Toshi Yoshihara. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Center for Security Studies. And he's also the author of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy, and the new book, Mao's Army Goes to Sea, The Island Campaigns and the Founding of China's Navy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, so I want I want to start off with with this. Um, you know, we know China has been rapidly building up its navy. It has more ships than the U.S. Navy now does. Um, but so after World War II, uh, sort of like the U.S. was in a position of incredible power, like it could have taken over anything. I wish it had, right, Shelley? Oh, Chris. Uh... But instead, it used its naval power to sort of secure global trade routes. And this was a great a benefit to lots of countries all over the world. Did I hit you too hard? A little bit. Okay. Uh, because, you know, they didn't have to worry about being naval powers. The, the, the U.S. kind of handled keeping all these trade routes open. So why does China want to establish itself as a naval power instead of just kind of leeching off the benefits of, you know, the U.S. putting all of this money into its navy? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, for a long time, that's exactly what China did, right? You know, China was essentially a free rider and depended on the U.S. Navy and its dominance of the high seas to secure access uh, to the oceans in order to facilitate um, international trade and commerce. That was, of course, so essential to China's uh, economic miracle. But in the early 2000s, uh, there was a real shift in attitude among Chinese decision makers that you can tell from a lot of the writings by Chinese strategists that began to argue that uh, no uh, self-respecting great power like China should ever depend on the goodwill of another, uh, what it considered to be a fickle great power like the United States to determine China's destiny. And so therefore, China needed to have its own independent seagoing capability to have access to the seas to continue its economic growth. And so we saw then a significant increase in China's power projection capabilities that arguably began in the 1990s and really accelerated uh, through the 2000s. We now see China having the largest navy in the world. But it's also uh, informed by what has been called uh, China's uh, sea lane insecurity. Uh, this idea that uh, China does not want to be held hostage by an external power uh, that could potentially conduct uh, a distant blockade against China, say over a war over Taiwan, and therefore choke off China's access to maritime trade. And of course, the main power that China is most concerned about is the United States and the U.S. ability to conduct such a distant blockade. And then thirdly, I think probably the most immediate uh, driver of China's uh, seaward turn is Taiwan and its other territorial disputes, because obviously Taiwan's an island. Uh, the fight that would go on uh, if, if a conflict were to erupt would be highly maritime in character. Uh, and so the Chinese Navy would play a significant role in any major war fighting scenario China also has territorial disputes with Japan over the Senkakus and, of course, territorial disputes with its many Southeast Asian neighbors over the Spratleys. All of those are maritime in character, and the Chinese Navy would play a leading role in resolving those disputes uh, if uh, things were to go kinetic. Yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned the sea lane insecurities because, you know, the U.S. has these big, throbbing sea lanes, and China, the CCP just has these little, little tiny sea lanes. So... And a lot so of the feeling insecure is that is that your point? It's, it's Chris? insecure, yeah, and I get that. So because China is limited by the the the, the first island so chain, you're saying you're saying that America has big sea lane energy, big sea lane energy. This is welcome to our podcast. <laughs> yes, I really wasn't expecting that, Chris. <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm just doing China analysis here. Try to keep up, Shelley. Okay. Uh, so what is as you said, China is limited by the first island chain. Unlike the U.S., it doesn't have a bunch of military naval bases all over the world. It can't project power. 
what is its vision for reaching outside of this first island chain? I mean, they only have a base in Djibouti. That would have gone nicely with the sea lane insecurity joke, Djibouti. Anyways, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think China's um, sea lane insecurity is driven, um, as you mentioned, by its maritime geography. Uh, Chinese strategists frequently describe China's immediate maritime periphery as among the most unfavorable among the great powers. Uh, and it's basically because of the choke points uh, formed by the first island chain. Uh, and of course, the Chinese have been worried about the so-called Malacca Dilemma for decades now, since the early 2000s. The concern there was that the United States might conduct a distant blockade west of the Malacca Strait and thereby choke off um, traffic, seaborne traffic running from uh, Europe through uh, the Mediterranean, through the Red Sea, through the Indian Ocean, going into the South China Sea through the Malacca Strait. Uh, and, and so China needs to develop naval capabilities in order to uh, counter, to hedge against this kind of a distant blockade. Now, while it's true uh, that China only has a major naval base in Djibouti up to now, we know from uh, various reporting, including the Pentagon's annual military report, that China has been prospecting for major naval bases and facilities all along the in, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean littorals and, and beyond. And so um, it's not inconceivable in the future that China could have a more uh, sizable and even permanent forward presence in bodies of water beyond uh, the so-called near seas. Um, and so we ought to be uh, prepared for, for that future, uh, especially given uh, China's rapid naval modernization, something that people you know, really downplayed uh, and, and really refuse to reckon with the possibility that China would become uh, a, a major naval power. I have a question about some of those um, Chinese potential military bases west of the Malacca Strait. So China has, um, I guess they call them civilian themed ports in, they've got one in Myanmar, one in Bangladesh, one in uh, Gwadarport in Pakistan and they may be developing one in the Maldives. How militarized are those, or how easy is it for them to fully militarize them the way they have an actual military base in Djibouti? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, I think right now uh, China has adopted a, a kind of a dual use approach, which is to uh, be able to use what are primarily commercial facilities that could then be, um, that, you know, that could play a dual role in supporting uh, naval vessels and so forth. I think uh, one of the key downsides of that approach, of course, uh, is um, both the reliability, the scale, the sophistication of the facilities to be able to support uh, Chinese naval forces, particularly in in wartime. Uh, and it's not just uh, the kind of the physical infrastructure of those facilities. I think one of the key stumbling blocks for China, of course, is the political reliability of the host nations. So by contrast, if you look at uh, U.S. forward bases uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, they are based uh, in, in, with you know, our close formal allies where we have formal military relationships, where we've had a longstanding military footprint, you know, a, a sophisticated base with uh, local shipyard workers you know, working on base, ha having a long established relationship, but also importantly, having the political will to stand with the United States uh, should crisis or conflict break out. Whereas I think a lot of the host nations that you've just listed um, may, may, may be you know, sitting on the fence or may even outright deny uh, Chinese access to those facilities in circumstances where you know, China would need those facilities most. And so I think there's a real trade-off in terms of the kinds of access that uh, China is hoping to, to achieve. But again, this is a sort of a, you know, a work in progress. And, and so, you know, one could, you know, uh, potentially foresee China further developing those facilities into something beyond what we see today. So what do you think is China's goal with this? Because the United States, as we talked about, is mainly to keep the shipping lines open. Is this just so the CCP has the way to conquer Taiwan? Do they have ambitions beyond that? Why do they want to become the dominant uh, naval power? Um, I think uh, China has both uh, regional ambitions and global 
global ambitions. And I think the, the immediate regional ambition, of course, is to have the tools to uh, coerce uh, Taiwan, failing that to conquer Taiwan outright. Um, but uh, you know, Chinese leaders also understand that uh, you know naval power has has you know ha- has a lot of uh, utility uh, you know beyond war fighting, and so having a, a force that can project power to to show Ch- China's flag around the world uh, is a, a a a critical element of uh, China's long term aims. The the way I think about sort of you know, why does China want a big Navy is to go back to uh, the China dream, which is Xi Jinping's bumper sticker for China's long term goals. Uh, and there are sort of external manifestations of the China dream that that would, I think, help to explain why the Navy is such an important part of its project. So I think the first, I think the most important one, in my view, is China's longer term ambitions to emerge as uh, the local dominant power the regional hegemon, if you will, of East Asia, that would put China at the epicenter of East Asian international relations. And what that means, of course, is to substantially reduce American power and influence in the region. And I think Chinese leaders believe that the Chinese Navy will play a very important role in nudging and pushing the United States out of the region. Uh, As I mentioned already, a key part of the China dream is to, quote unquote, reunify Taiwan. Uh, and, and again, because of its maritime character, China needs a navy to do that. Uh, China also wants to conduct what it calls a great power diplomacy. And the best tool to show the flag is the navy. It's the most important outward facing part of uh, Chinese statecraft. And finally, we have the Belt and Road Initiative. The entire half of that initiative is maritime in character. And so China believes that it needs to have a powerful naval force to protect its proliferating overseas interest, many of those interests connected by sea. So I think the China dream itself tells us a lot about why uh, the Chinese Navy is so important to Xi Jinping and his subordinates. So just strategically, if China is able to take Taiwan, is that enough to effectively break uh, the first island chain as far as being able to contain China? Is that enough for China to then be able to project power outward, especially with um, alliances in the Pacific Island nations like the Solomon Islands. Yes. Yeah, so um, I actually recently wrote, an, uh, wrote a piece about how uh, China views Taiwan as a geostrategic asset. Uh, I think there has been for a long time analysts who sort of, again, downplayed the idea that Taiwan was valuable to China uh, as a geostrategic asset. But if you read uh, Chinese writings going back 20 years, I think they make it very clear that Taiwan is a geopolitical asset for a variety of reasons. So the first uh, uh, reason is that uh, China, uh, uh, Taiwan actually could potentially form a part of China's natural defensive barrier because, um, you know, when they think about the geostrategic configuration of the features along the first island chain, some Chinese strategists have linked the sort of the the most... um, eastern tip of Shandong Peninsula and the the east coast of Taiwan and the southern coast of Hainan as representing the most forward extension of China's natural sort of, you know, endowed territories. And so having Taiwan would help to basically set up this defensive wall that helps to uh, defend China's near seas. Uh, Chinese strategists also believe because of Taiwan's position sitting at the midpoint of the first island chain and, of course, forming the Taiwan Strait is that it is a critical hub for maritime communications. It really is central in terms of sea lines of communications, connecting markets in Northeast Asia all the way through Southeast Asia. And then there's also an offensive component, I think, that gets at your question, which is that Chinese strategists believe that getting Taiwan back would allow China to station uh, forward station military forces, air forces, missile forces, uh, surface ships, as well as submarines. Uh, and in particular, Taiwan would give China direct access to the deep waters of the Pacific. And so having Taiwan from China's perspective would give China all of these geostrategic advantages. And on top of that, it would in many ways break the first island chain in the sense that from Japan's perspective, uh, Taiwan has basically been in w- what you might call friendly hands for over a century. So, you know, 
Taiwan was a colony of Japan's uh, for about 50 years. Then we had an anti-communist regime under Chiang Kai-shek on the island. Then in the 1990s, uh, Taiwan liberalized and became a vibrant democracy and a critical economic partner of Japan. So for a hundred years, Japan has not had to worry about this critical southern flank. It's it's sort of security anchor to the south. And so if China were to take over Taiwan, it would be a geopolitical earthquake for Tokyo. It would fundamentally transform the way our most important ally in East Asia views the security environment. Uh, and I think one last thing to know is that the only way for China to achieve uh, regional hegemony is, first of all, to wrap up all of its uh, most important territorial disputes, including Taiwan, that would set itself up for further regional domination. And we know from history uh, that global power's first step is to achieve regional dominance before they can look further afield. And so in, in my view, if China does indeed have more ambitious global ambition, then it has to achieve regional dominance. And in my view, that regional dominance will run through Taiwan. So you, you mentioned a bunch of these you know, reasons why Taiwan is so geostrategically important, but you also alluded to the fact that people kept downplaying that angle. Why do you think people were downplaying Taiwan's importance in China? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know their exact motivations, um, but I, you know, there, there, you know, there has typically been a pushback back in the day about how, yes, you know, Taiwan is a so-called unsinkable aircraft carrier, but it's also an immovable one. In other words, you know, whatever uh, military assets that China could place on the island of Taiwan, uh, it would be, you know, potentially very vulnerable uh, to uh, U.S. Um, attack. Uh, but, you know, again, if you look at the, the kinds of long-range weaponry that uh, China has been able to develop, uh, its ability to provide a, a, a protective umbrella over Taiwan, beneath which other offensive weapons can be deployed and placed on, on Taiwan, I think this idea that, you know, PLA assets located on Taiwan would be, you know, vulnerable to a U.S. long-range strike. I think is um, is far-fetched um, um, in my view. Um, I think in terms of the offense-defense balance, if you will, uh, having assets on Taiwan benefits uh, China uh, more than it 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 um, it has these um, you know outweighs the strategic risk that China faces. I mean, I think this makes it very clear the differences. <clears throat> In ambition, you know, the United States, its naval power was to ensure global shipping lanes stay open. China, from the outset, its goal is territorial conquest. Yes, uh, you know, and I think, you know, one of the one of the sharpest asymmetries, uh, you know, in terms of the U.S. approach to the region and the Chinese approach is that the United States is a, you know, a status quo power, right? You know, it, you know, it has a fundamental interest in preserving uh, the order that it helped create in East Asia that, of course, led to all this prosperity that benefited everyone. Uh, China is fundamentally a revisionist power. You know, I, I mean, all of its aims, whether it's, it's discontent with the current territorial status quo and so forth, suggest that China wants to overturn critical pillars of that order because it sees that as its, you know, vital national interest. And I think one of the things that makes this interaction between China and, and the United States in many ways asymmetrical uh, is that as a revisionist power, uh, Beijing in many ways has the initiative, right? If its goals are to, you know, achieve change, to make changes to the current order, then it has the, it holds the initiative. It will take a series of action both militarily, legally, diplomatically, politically, to undermine the order. As a, as a status quo power, I think one of the, uh, one of the disadvantages, um, if you will, for the United States is that it's, it's, um, it, you know, it's almost by its nature more reactive, right? Seeking to prevent changes to the status quo. But, but I don't think that that precludes Washington fro from being proactive, right? I think the United States can still, as a status quo, uh, think ahead and be proactive and not be so risk averse and take actions that actually can help to knock Beijing uh, on its back foot.
how has the U.S. response to this 20-some-year buildup in China's naval power been? Well, um, unfortunately, uh, not so well. Um, I, you know, you've had um, previous guests like um, um, Captain Fennell, who has uh, who's written uh, uh, quite extensively on this and has spoken eloquently about uh, the challenges that the United States uh, has faced. I think, you know, um, part of it has been um, the, you might call it the afterglow of, of um, American uh, post-Cold War triumphalism, uh, and that um, America's uh, victory in the Cold War, I think, created a, a, a set of pathologies, if you will, or a deeply uh, embedded set of assumptions about what the world will look like in the post-Cold War period. And I think one of the key assumptions was that the U.S. military power essentially will remain unchallenged uh, for the foreseeable future in in the decades to to come. Um, I think you know it's really telling if you just go back to uh, some of the writings by uh, major think tanks in the early 2000s that talked about the future of the military balance in East Asia. And they were basically arguing that uh, China's military modernization would be modest and regional in scale, and that the United States could maintain its dominance into the 2020s. Uh, and of course, we now know uh, those forecasts and predictions were, were uh, wrong, were frankly wrong, right? Uh, that, 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 that China's uh, modernization that we've seen over the past two decades have exceeded um, all of our expectations, uh, including my own. Uh, it's just been incredible, frankly, to, to, to witness this, this rise. And it's, frankly, difficult to keep up with all of the developments that we see almost a weekly, if not, you know, um, if not daily in terms of the newest developments in China's naval modernization. So I think this assumption that the United States would remain dominant for the foreseeable future, I think, um, produced... Um, um, complacency, in my view, uh, that has led to, you know, where we are, where we are having quite a tough time uh, responding uh, and, uh, you know, maintaining American superiority in the Western Pacific. Is there a specific uh, naval development over the last 20 years coming from China that has surprised you most? Um, I, y you know, it's, it's, it's not a specific set of capabilities in particular. I think it's the aggregation of all of the capabilities that uh, China has developed. And I think it's important to note, firstly, that you know when we talk about the broader military balance, that it's not just about the Chinese Navy. It's really about anything that China can bring to bear in the maritime domain. So I would, I would think more broadly about this in terms of Chinese sea power, which is really um, the use of all implements of national power to be able to influence events uh, at, at sea. And if you think about it in those terms, uh, China's development of the land-based uh, anti-ship ballistic missile, I think was, uh, you know, was an important technical development. A, a development, by the way, a skeptic said that China couldn't possibly uh, produce because the Soviets failed. And I think people continue to push back against this idea that, uh, you know, that uh, this is a usable weapon. Uh, we're obviously seeing that being played out in the Red Sea to suggest that even second, third rate military powers can, can, can wield the anti-ship ballistic missile. Um, we also are seeing uh, China's Air Force modernization in which China can conduct uh, long range strikes from, from the air. And then, of course, uh, a panoply of long-range anti-ship cruise missiles outfitted to China's surface vessels, to China's submarines, arming these, these uh, ships to the teeth with long-range anti-ship cruise missiles. So I think it is really uh, it, it, the, the, this, this accumulation of all of these developments. I would also add you know, another key element of this is mass. China has been building uh, its ships, its missiles at breakneck speed. And, you know, as you've all heard, I'm sure, you know, this idea that uh, quantity has a quality all its own. Uh, I think uh, China is, you know, definitely uh, meeting the definition of, of that dictum. You know, China can throw a lot of stuff at us, um, especially against our very capital intensive assets like our carriers and our other surface combatants that, that we would be hard pressed to lose. It's a fleet that we would not be willing to risk. Um, 
And of course, if we were ever to suffer significant casualties uh, or damage to those ships, uh, it would take a long time for us to repair them, to put them back to sea. So I think it's, it's you know, certain uh, technological capabilities like long-range precision strike weaponry and mass, I think, uh, had a huge impact on the military balance in the Western Pacific. So what's at stake for the average American who maybe only cares about their TikToks if <laughs> China becomes the dominant naval power on the other side of the world? Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I so maybe it's important to step back and talk about American grand strategy and sort of talk about why the United States adopted this grand strategy since the end of World War II and how China is challenging that grand strategy and what that might mean for average Americans. So the United States adopted a, a forward-leaning grand strategy along what we call the rimlands of Eurasia. So that the rimlands would include Europe, East Asia, and later on the Middle East. Uh, this is the rimland that surrounds the Eurasian landmass. And what's so important about those parts of the rimlands, of course, is that they are the most uh, economically productive, uh, the most important economic centers of, of the world. And so for the United States, it was imperative for the United States in the post-World War II era to have uh, unfettered access to those markets. And, and I would argue the United States had an imperative to have unfettered access to those parts of the world, arguably since its founding. You know, it's worth noting that we had um, American whalers, uh, you know, um, um, conducting trade and so forth in the North Pacific, even before the American founding. So the United States had had an enduring interest in having unfettered economic access to those parts of the world. And in order to have that unfettered access, it is to have a favorable balance of power in those parts of the world. And we learned uh, through a great power war during the Second World War that when we let, allowed the balances in those regions to shift in favor of a local hegemon, then American access and important American interest in those regions then uh, would be held hostage or would be blocked off altogether. And so if we fast forward to today and looking out into the future about what China might do, one, might, uh, one, one could easily imagine a future in which a hegemonic China essentially um, undermines uh, US access to markets that, that China will dictate the terms of American access to that part of the world. Again, the most important economic center of gravity in the world today. Um, China might dictate uh, our relations with our formal allies. Ideally, what they would want to do is for, you know, you know, for us to no longer have these uh, formal treaty um, alliances with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines and Australia and so forth. And so, uh, you know, to you know, to put it simply, the region would be less safe because China would want to dictate terms on the region and America's uh, engagement with the region. And I think the American economy and the average Americans would be um, impoverished, if you will, from that as well, because it would mean diminished access to the region or at least access to the region on China's terms. Uh, and in my view, uh, that you know, not only is that a world that our allies don't want to live in. In, in, in East Asia, but it's probably a world that the United States and the American public would not want to inhabit as well. Didn't the CCP pass laws that allow them to uh, inspect ships going through the South China Sea and even open fire on vessels? Um, I, so I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with uh, China's um, domestic laws uh, when it comes to uh, those types of actions. But I mean, I can certainly see in, say, a scenario over Taiwan where uh, China might declare a maritime quarantine, basically uh, impl impose what would be a blockade. And China might be able to use uh, domestic legal mechanisms to enforce that quarantine, right? So you can imagine China declaring a uh, customs inspection regime in order to uh, reroute shipping headed for Taiwan uh, to have to go to mainland ports first for you know inspection uh, in order to secure China's security concerns. Um, because of course, since Taiwan is a part of China, this would be a 
domestic law enforcement issue. Uh, and that might be one way by which China can can start to uh, strangle um, or, or, you know, at least to diminish resources and supplies and material reaching reaching Taiwan. And in that scenario, I can envision China uh, using its uh, domestic uh, legal mechanisms um, in order to to do that. And I think that has an added sort of diplomatic benefit, right? Because if China can tell the world that China is engaging in this customs inspection regime uh, because it's an internal affair, uh, this might be one way to uh, take away rationale of third parties like the United States and Japan in intervening, um, you know, in you know, um, in a scenario like that, and I think you know this kind of a gray zone tactic, I think, uh, could cause all sorts of political and diplomatic problems for the United States and its allies. You know, it could uh, potentially significantly, for example, uh, tie Japan's hands. Japan might might have problems, you know, coming up with a political rationale for acting. Uh, in conjunction with the United States to help help Taiwan, it's it really is like Rome built roads and all the roads went back to Rome. Uh, the United States did the same thing just with shipping lanes. I bring that up mainly because I think about Rome every day. Mm-hmm. But but also this 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 is just an existential threat to the United States. This is the basis for uh, an American led order. That's right. You know, and, you know, the the American led order uh, is what allowed for the globalization process to happen that allowed for the prosperity to spread across the international system, not least of which was China. China was arguably the great, the greatest beneficiaries of America's role as the guardian of the seas, uh, because this system was remains fundamentally a positive sum game. Right. The United States essentially kept the seas open as a what you know what's called an international public good, so that everyone could have free access to it. And it's a positive sum game because uh, the addition of a of of a user to that public good does not diminish access to that good to others, right? So a public good could be you know could be the analogy is a public park, right? You know, and you know an additional visitor to that park does not diminish uh, another user of that park and that user's ability to enjoy the facilities provided by that park. And so the U.S. Navy basically pl- played that role in ensuring that everyone could make free use of the seas. Uh, and I fear that uh, China's domination of the near seas, for example, would significantly uh, undermine uh, that particular principle. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think it's important to note here that this idea of open access, this idea of an international public good is indivisible. In other words, you can't take exception to the rule in one place. Uh, uh, you, know, you, you know, you have to accept this principle universally so that everyone uh, um, can, can um, enjoy that access. And I worry again that because of China's uh, uh, view of uh, the international maritime regimes, uh, and, and it's more sort of uh, negative sum, perhaps even zero sum, uh, zero sum, or even negative sum view of the maritime domains could could do some real harm to this order. So, so what happens when you have this public good, like a public park, but then China comes in and they start. And they start taking yeah. all the fish like out they, of the park. Or they start doing things like, okay, they rope off a playground. They're like, this is our playground. No one else can come Always to this playground. Been. Uh, you know, yes, yeah, so these Qing Dynasty maps showed that the, we had been to this playground, you know. Since ancient so, times. So what happens, like, how do you respond to that while keeping the park open? Yeah, uh, and and so I think this is what the United States and its allies have been doing. I think the bumper sticker "Free and Open Indo-Pacific" is designed precisely to 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 fight uh, China's attempt to you know to continue that um, analogy, rope off parts parts of the park, right? So I think you know China right now essentially uh, wants to have it both ways, right? It wants to uh, impose. Um, restrictions on foreign use of the uh, near sea, so running from the Yellow Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan Strait down down to the to the South China Sea. But 
if it's outside of the near seas, then everyone should have you know free access, including China's free access to to the global commons. And you know you can see how that's not going to work, right? You cannot you cannot take exception to you know to that rule without uh, having an undue negative impact on the overall system. So what the United States has done uh, in part is to conduct these uh, regular uh, freedom and freedom of navigation operations uh, to to basically demonstrate that the United States can operate freely in, in, in the air above the sea, on the sea, beneath the sea, uh, in accord with uh, international law. Um, and, and it's, it, you know, it, U.S. allies have have um, have also done the same. I think it's important to note, though, that we we should not see the freedom of navigation operations as a kind of a panacea, as a kind of a silver bullet that will solve all of our problems. Right? We need to push back against China beyond simply conducting these these operations because these operations are um, episodic, and you know uh, they they it, it, you know you can. You can sail through the sea to make a principled point, but that doesn't really change the realities on the ground, right? And so, you know, if you're sitting, if you're the PLA uh, sitting on one of those uh, man-made islands in the Spratleys, you know, you can literally just wave to the American ships and say, "All right, fine." You know, you've, you know, you've made your point, but you haven't done much to change the realities um, on the ground. But I think, you know, but we we just have to make sure that we cannot allow China to uh, set set precedents that allow China then to continue to chip away at the order. So what might be some other things that the U.S. could do besides the freedom of navigation? Well, I, you know, um, I think what we're seeing is the United States uh, forming a series of uh, overlapping network of informal and formal ties uh, amongst uh, like-minded states, uh, like-minded maritime powers in particular, uh, that have a shared interest in keeping the oceans open. So I think one important tool that the United States has, and it's in many ways an advantage, is that uh, the, the, the United States has this convening power, that uh, it can convene uh, like-minded maritime states to form these relationships. So whether it's the Quad, which is uh, US, uh, Japan, Australia, and India, whether it's AUKUS, which of course now we're hearing that Japan could potentially be involved uh, as, as as an associate power of of some kind. Uh, if you look at the relationship that uh, Japan is forming independently with Australia, with India, uh, Japan's attempts to build the capacity of frontline states like the Philippines and and Vietnam, or the bilateral relationship between Japan, South Korea, and the United States. I think all of those sort of bilateral and minilateral relationships uh, can, can really help to not only show regional and international solidarity against uh, China's uh, views of the maritime domain, but it also helps to sort of isolate China um, on, this, on this front. And, you know, and I would add that uh, no power has done more to stimulate this uh, regional and extra regional response than China itself. Right? It's been China's assertiveness um, in you know in the region in making excessive jurisdictional claims and so forth that has encouraged all of these frontline states to to band together. So I want to ask about something historical because uh, your your latest book is about you know Mao's army goes to sea. It's about looking at some of the uh, historical things that led to the formation of the People's Liberation Army Navy and what they did in the past. And I, I want to I wanna ask about this because, you know, shortly after Mao declared the, the formation of the PRC in October uh, 1949, the, the Mao's uh, Army Navy tried to take over Jinmen and then tried to take over Hainan Island. What happened there? What did they learn from that? And, and then how does that um, you know, manifest now 70 years later. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing up my uh, latest book. I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, um, I think one of the, one of the narratives that I wanted to, to correct, if you will, was this idea that uh, China didn't really go to sea in a serious way until the early 1980s 
when um, Admiral Liu Hua Ching, um, uh, with guidance from Paramount leader Deng Xiaoping, uh, developed um, a sort of a more formal naval strategy. Right, he's considered uh, sort of the modern found, you know, the the founder of the modern navy that we see today. But I, you know, I you know, the point that I wanted to make with the book was that actually China's quest for sea power and China's turn to the seas goes all the way back, right, to the founding of the People's Republic and even before. In fact, um, the founding uh, of the Chinese Navy, uh, the first naval organization established by the CCP, was the was the East China Regional Navy in April of 1949. So six months. Uh, before the uh, formal uh, establishment of of the People's Republic. Uh, and I think uh, many of the stories that I tell in the book showcase that Mao and his subordinates, in the midst of the Chinese Civil War, which wasn't over yet, right, in, in, in uh, early 1949, had begun to think ahead about what China needed to do uh, in the maritime domain because they understood that once they took over uh, the mainland, that they still needed to finish off the nationalists uh, uh, um, that, that were dug in on the offshore islands, some of them just a few miles off the mainland, as well as uh, Chiang Kai-shek's forces that had uh, retreated to to Taiwan. So, you know, the 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 main one of the key points of the books is to say that uh, Chinese leaders, the CCP leadership, have been uh, deeply sensitive to maritime issues uh, even before the civil war ended. And the two major campaigns that I highlight in the book uh, are actually very, sort of very important to the Chinese N Navy's historiography, the story that it tells itself that sort of helps to develop the Navy's uh, sense of its own, um, its own purpose. So the, the, I'll start with the Jingmen campaign uh, that, that began in late 1949 um, as a result of really bad planning, a uh, really bad set of assumptions, bad intelligence underestimation of the nationalists, um, uh, the PLA uh, sought to basically uh, take Jingmen uh, uh, in, in one go in a kind of a Normandy style type, you know, traditional amphibious assault. Um, it turned out to be an absolute disaster because the nationalists were, were ready. Uh, and uh, because of um, bad understanding of the local terrain, uh, many of the uh, the wooden boats that were used to transport the troops were uh, trapped uh, on on the beaches when the when the tides uh, receded, and uh, the troops on the mainland were basically uh, stuck and they were wiped out. And in in about uh, three or four days, uh, about a division worth about nine thousand troops were annihilated on the island of Jingmen. And it was that campaign that really awakened Mao and his subordinates. To the realities of amphibious operations. And Jingmen campaign, the 49 campaign, uh, remains a sort of a classic case study that PLA analysts continue to study and relitigate, you know, looking at the lessons learned from that and what that might mean for uh, China's uh, potential future amphibious uh, campaign against Taiwan. Uh, the, the other campaign that I looked at is a really interesting one. It's the Hainan campaign in 1950, uh, that actually was a successful one. And that amphibious operation uh, remains one of the largest post-war amphibious operations. Uh, it involved 45,000 PLA troops that landed on the northern shores of Hainan and in a, a rapid series of um, land uh, maneuvers were able to seize Hainan. And of course, Hainan is an island about the size of Taiwan, or to put it in Japanese terms, is about the size of of, of Kyushu, the southern main island of Japan. So this is a major geographical feature. Uh, and the PLA was able to, through careful planning, uh, through lessons learned that they learned from the earlier failure at Jingmen, were able to pull off this really impressive um, amphibious operation. And the Hainan Island campaign also, I think, serves as a critical case study that continues to inform uh, thinking among Chinese strategists uh, about uh, future um, amphibious operations. And, you know, I would also add that, uh, you know, what is really interesting about the Hainan campaign was that uh, they had an indigenous um, guerrilla force located on the island that served as a force multiplier. So they would basically link up with um, advanced PLA troops 
uh, that were uh, brought ashore secretly along the east and west coast of Hainan Island. And that helped to sort of change the local uh, military balance on the island and tied up the nationalists essentially from the rear area. And I think one of the interesting parallels that I see in, 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 a, in a modern Taiwan scenario is the potential use of fifth column forces on the island that would be used to tie up uh, Taiwanese defenders on the island to create a distraction uh, while the main assault uh, takes place um, around Taiwan. So what what kind of, um, describe this fifth column and what kind of distractions they could create to prevent uh, a Taiwanese response to a, a military naval invasion? So presumably fifth column forces would have uh, the goal of um, attacking critical infrastructure um, you know, they could, you know, they could, you know, they can conduct sabotage operations against uh, critical communication nodes. Uh, you can also imagine fifth column forces engaging in um, decapitation attempts, essentially assassination attempts against Taiwan's most important political and military leaders. Um, and, and, you know, and, and these might not be, you know, war winning uh, strategies, but they might be able to impose enough costs uh, on on Taiwan that 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 might potentially make a difference tactically um, against Taiwan's defense against the bigger threat, which is the PLA coming across the Taiwan Strait against Taiwanese defenders. You know, you, you talk about the fifth column people like China sneaking in, uh, essentially guerrilla agent. It, it does make me think about um, the stories of military age Chinese men crossing the U.S. southern border illegally. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yes, and you know, um, I'm um, I've actually been doing a lot of PLA operational histories, going back to um, PLA campaigns during the Chinese Civil War and even before, going back to the 1920s. And I, you know, I think the important point, uh, you know, to make here is that the CCP and the PLA and the Red Army before it has had a long tradition of using saboteurs of using secret agents and double agents to infiltrate enemy armed forces to quote unquote, they call it disintegrating the enemy from within. Uh, and, and, and so again, you know, what, what, what the CCP PLA did uh, on uh, Hainan Island in 1950 is not anything new. And that, uh, you know, and they've, you know, in 19, by 1950, they've had basically almost a 30 year tradition in using saboteurs double agents and and so forth. So I think with this well-established tradition, one would expect that uh, China would turn to this uh, toolkit again, whether it's over Taiwan. And of course, you know, as you mentioned, possibly uh, having implications in terms of uh, America's homeland security. I mean, I suppose in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, they could tie up the US by activating fifth column people inside the United States. Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, when we're when we're thinking about the defense of Taiwan these days, I think we do have to think about how that might relate to um, homeland defense. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's and it's both because of this potential for um, uh, fifth column forces inside of the United States, but also because China increasingly has these longer range um, projectiles, you know, missile systems and so forth that could potentially threaten the American homeland. And so, you know, this is, you know, I think one of the assumptions that I think we need to begin to challenge uh, is this idea that if we're fighting China over Taiwan, that this is going to be an away game. I'm not sure that that's going to be entirely true in the future. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the assumption is that it would be an away game because people don't think that China would directly attack the U.S. because they would want to keep the U.S. out of Taiwan? Well, so, so you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think the question that you're asking is, you know, what's the balance between sort of doing things that will guarantee American intervention versus doing things that will help to keep the United States out? I think it really depends on uh, Chinese decision makers' assumptions about the United States, right? So if Xi Jinping and his subordinates are absolutely convinced that Washington will be all in in one way or another, no matter how the PLA goes about attacking Taiwan, then I think my, my sense is that Beijing will be a lot less restrained. Uh, and that means that Beijing has more of an incentive to horizontally escalate, whether it's broadening its attacks against U.S. forces on the first island chain to, you know, 
attacking further in, not only on U.S. forces on Guam and the second island chain, possibly out to the third island chain in terms of U.S. forces in Hawaii and potentially out to the American homeland. And, and, and I think you know, one of the things we need to keep in mind here, of course, is is a sort of an asymmetry here, right? The United States has been geared since the end of the of World War II in the post-war era to fight the away game. And so we're, we're typically not well postured to dealing with threats uh, against the American homeland. And so I think as a Chinese strategist, it would behoove them to think about ways to knock us off balance by basically going after us in places where we're typically not as well prepared and not as well structured. And that would suggest, again, uh, you know, homeland defense should be uh, an increasing priority for Washington. Although there's a strategic risk there too, which is that uh, it could be a Pearl Harbor scenario where Japan thought that they could do substantial damage to throw the U.S. off balance by attacking Pearl Harbor. And the result was that it just made America super angry and then you know declared war on Japan immediately. Yeah, I mean, I think you know that that trade-off, I think, you know, continues to inform um, Chinese thinking. Um, so, you know, you know, one way to think about this is to think about the costs and benefits at the strategic level and costs and benefits at the operational level, right? So, you know, if you, you know, if you want to conduct a limited attack against Taiwan, right, uh, that is sort of potentially strategically beneficial because you re- you reduce the chances of American and allied intervention. Um, but, but, you know, but the risk is quite big operationally because what you're doing is you're basically leaving American and allied forces intact, right? Uh, the other alternative, of course, is to conduct a broad attack. You basically try to take as many pieces off the board as you can. Um, and of course, that is sort of operationally efficacious, right? Because you're reducing American and allied combat power at the get-go. Uh, the strategic risk, of course, is you're virtually guaranteeing American and allied intervention. Um, you know, but again, going back to my earlier point, it really depends on Xi Jinping's assumptions about his adversaries, right? If he's convinced that the United States is going to be all in anyway, then I think the strategic risk of horizontal escalation basically goes away because it, it's basically baked into PLA defense planning, right? Um, and of course, one of the key differences with the Pearl Harbor analogy, of course, is that, you know, we we no longer have the defense industrial base to make up for our losses. So, you know, a lot of the significant damage that we would suffer from a major uh, PLA first strike, for example, uh, would be far more damaging to us today than it was uh, during Pearl Harbor because, of course, the United States uh, had already embarked on a major naval buildup, right? In 1940, the United States passed the uh, the, the uh, two... The, the Two Ocean Navy Act that that really produced all of the ships that would come into play to help the United States conduct the counteroffensive against Imperial Japan. Um, we don't have anything like that, uh, and 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 so in many ways today, in my view, uh, we really do have to fight with the forces that we have, not 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 with the forces that we wish we had. Um, and and so you know if you think about American decision makers during the Pacific War including the campaign over Midway, you know, a lot of the calculations about when and how you risk the fleet were informed by the, by the notion, by almost a a kind of a safety valve that there was all this stuff, right. From, uh, from the U S industrial base that was going to be coming online. And that deeply influenced uh, how uh, naval leaders thought about risk. Um, Again, today uh, we don't have anything like that. Um, And, and, and so, you know, the, the risks to angering the United States today uh, could be quite different from the risks that Japan encountered uh, during the Pacific War. So which way do you think Xi Jinping is leaning? Which way do you think it's more likely to go? A direct attack on Taiwan or a more horizontal attack on allies? So, you know, I, you know, I think so, you know, if we're thinking about uh, this high end sort of, you know, kinetic war fight, uh, and this is my sort of personal opinion, uh, and it's and it's based on my reading of uh, Chinese writings, uh, uh, particularly about Japan. Uh, and, you know, and, and you know, you know, what you get from these writings is Chinese strategists just 
thinking the absolute worst about the Japanese, right? They, they just don't give the Japanese any benefit of the doubt. They demonize the Japanese. They think that they're the worst of the worst. They're just basically um, irredeemable uh, group of people. Uh, and, and, and so if that attitude, and it's a big if, if that attitude uh, reflects even partially uh, decision makers at the highest levels of, of China, including those in the Central Military Commission, um, then, you know, one, one, one might uh, conclude that Xi Jinping could talk himself into this idea that the United States and Japan would be all in, right? And that there's no convincing, that, you know, there's no way to convince uh, China and uh, there's no way to convince the United States and Japan not to intervene. And so there is less restraint uh, on, on China in that case. However, I think I would want to further add that, that there are different ways, of course, for uh, China and the PLA to go about taking, taking Taiwan. So I mentioned, I think, the, the blockade scenario, I think, is another sort of very problematic scenario for the United States and, and Japan. Uh, and, 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 and the purpose of that kind of an approach, a more sort of gray zone, below the threshold of conflict approach, uh, is partly to make um, discussions, debates, calculations about intervention very difficult for Washington and Tokyo. Hmm. I mean, one of the the additional strategic risks of doing it the way that you suggest she might lean is, is that when you do these horizontal attacks, let's say on infrastructure in a democracy like Japan or the United States, it will galvanize public anger towards the CCP in a way that has a lot more political influence on uh, government and military decisions than it would in an authoritarian country where public opinion counts for very little. It's true. Um, you know, you know, one of the things that I've been starting to uh, think about more is um, what does the post-war world look like, right? In, in this kind of a scenario. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've heard from the war games done by CSIS uh, in, in, in recent years that uh, suggested that, uh, that, you know, that the United States would, you know, more than likely uh, win in most of these scenarios. But I think one of the things, and the, I think the authors of the report uh, uh, acknowledge, and I think it's something we need to think about, is that, uh, but, but what does that win actually look like after the war is over, right? So if, if we're talking about this expanded attack in which China conducts massive kinetic assaults against key infrastructure, and basically we've got Yokosuka Naval Base, Sasebo Naval Base, Kadena Air Base, and other major infrastructure in ruins, right? In ruins uh, because of this conflict. And the U.S. and its allies technically win. Um, how is the United States going to help to defend the, uh, you know, the order that it constructed without the critical infrastructure and basing that's required to do so? Um, you know, that, that could potentially be a pretty problematic victory in the sense that you then actually don't have the, the instruments to maintain the peace. And I think that's also just as worrisome as the uh, escalatory dynamics that you talked about. Do you have a sense for how China's current economic troubles would affect its naval growth and uh, plans to project naval power, including a Taiwan invasion? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not an economist uh, and, and so forth, but I do, uh, 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 you know, know from, you know, based on what the Chinese have announced is that, you know, China's defense spending uh, continues to take priority. That that you know it continues to sustain uh, high rates of growth despite the economic slowdown. Um, so I think that's 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 one point. Uh, you know the second point is you know I think it's important to note that China has already built up a significant amount of military capital over the last twenty and thirty years. And I would argue that even if China stopped building today, if they if they just basically stopped building anything related to the PLA. This PLA would still be a significant regional and partial global force for many years to come, as long as they can, you know, sustain and sustain and maintain those forces. So China is is already a formidable power. Um, and 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 you know what we've seen also, you know, if you think about 
uh, historical parallels, right? You know, Japan went through the so-called lost decade. Now it's a lost three decades, right? And yet, you know, Japan is still the third largest economy in the world, is still an advanced economy and can still pull a lot of strategic weight. I would argue that China is the same, right? You know, depending on the trajectory of China's decline, even China's relative decline would enable Beijing to have you know, significant amount of national power to influence events uh, um, in its own neighborhood um, and abroad. So, I, you know, I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm, um, uh, you know, I, I don't take much comfort, I guess, in uh, recent news about China's economic decline. I do feel like there is this strain of like hoping that the CCP is just going to implode, like in its own weight, so that we don't have to do anything about it. it it's like. I think maybe that complacency that you're talking about again, like that post Cold War complacency. Right. But I mean, hope is not a strategy. No. I mean, but what do you think now that we've seen this 20, 30 year buildup? Is that complacency changing in America's strategic thinking, or are we still kind of stuck, like spinning our wheels? Yeah, I mean, I think we've become, um, you know, much more aware, you know, I'm sure you, you know, you're all familiar with sort of the bipartisan, apparent bipartisan consensus that we're seeing on the Hill when it comes to China. We're seeing, you know, quite a bit of continuity from the Trump to the Biden administration uh, on, uh, on, you know, competing with, with China, although I think we can agree or disagree about how well Biden uh, how well the Biden administration is doing uh, in that regard. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've certainly awakened uh, to, to the challenge. There's a lot less debate about whether China's a problem or not. But my main concern is um, what are we doing about it? You know, are we actually investing in the capabilities that's required to uh, deter, deter China? And I think to go back to your complacency point is, you know, I do worry that there are these voices that continue to inject themselves in the debate. You know, they will they will grasp onto any fact that suggests that China's weak or that China's weakening or that, you know, China's long term prospects are so bad that we don't have to worry to kind of force us to, you know, let our foot off the pedal. Uh, and I think we really do have to resist that siren song that 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 somehow China will sort of create problems for itself in such a way that we don't have to worry. Uh, I I you know, it's a very, very, to me, a very dangerous argument. I think what the the more productive way of thinking about China's relative decline is to say that we can expect that China could potentially be uh, relatively less competitive, say, in the 2030s. The, the, the responsibility for us is how do we then uh, make the costs of China competing against the United States uh, higher, right? You know, how do we make life more difficult when China is running into many of these structural headwinds? What can we do, whether it's you know, our economic statecraft, our technological statecraft, or whether it's our military uh, restructuring and modernization? What can we do, essentially, to take advantage of an environment that is less favorable to China? So, uh, uh, you know, in contrast to this idea that, you know, we can just let our foot off the pedal is actually we, you know, we need to continue to press ahead to think about ways to make the environment, the competitive environment, uh, that much more competitive uh, for, for China and to take advantage of the shifts in the terms of the competition. You know, you mentioned thinking about what a post-war environment would look like if there was an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, since the U.S. and China are nuclear powers, how do you think that would factor in? Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I've i also been uh, looking at uh, China's nuclear, you know, modernization. I think there are sort of different dynamics that are going on, right? So China's strategic nuclear modernization is creating greater uh, mutual vulnerability. And what that means, of course, is that China now can 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 hit back. That actually creates uh, what's been called—I hate to use wonkish terms—but the um, the uh, stability instability paradox, which is that it creates stability at the strategic level because of mutual vulnerability. But under that stability, you have great powers basically using different forms of military force beneath, right? You know, beneath that mutual vulnerability to get what it wants, and so. 
uh, one scholar has called this growing mutual vulnerability as uh, making the region safe for conventional war from China's perspective, right? China now has a freer hand to conduct a conventional military operation without the fear of the United States engaging in nuclear threats and nuclear coercion. So that's so that's one one level, which is uh, China's nuclear modernization is actually making conventional war more thinkable from China's perspective. There's also a theater nuclear modernization that I think we don't pay enough attention to, right? China has been has been developing a whole family of theater range missiles that can be nuclear armed, uh, including the DF-26 that China military report says will, will is the first um, long, uh, you know, long range weapon that can allow China to conduct precision strikes with nuclear warheads. What that means, in my view, is that it now gives China theater capabilities to make uh, local threats against the United States um, and its allies. Um, and how this works is if these weapons are designed to only hit regional targets and will spare essentially the American homeland, then Beijing can pose a really sort of troubling question, right? Which is, you know, uh, will the United States really trade um, Los Angeles for Tokyo, for example, right? Um, and, and, and so the, these uh, theater weapons actually really get at the credibility of um, American extended deterrence. And it's really a replay of what happened in the late stages of the Cold War when the Soviet Union did exactly the same thing. They had theater range missiles that were aimed exclusively at European capitals. And Moscow essentially asked Washington the same question. Would you really trade New York for Bonn if the only targets we're threatening are European targets? And so in, in, you know, in many ways, the, the past is the future now. We are now uh, seeing this being replayed in the Asian theater. And I think one last point to make about this is that there's a huge asymmetry when it comes to theater nuclear capabilities. China has them, we don't. Uh, and, and that asymmetry is something that uh, China can, can exploit if it wants to coerce uh, U.S. allies, potentially, for example, to give uh, Japan cold feet. Well, this is this is this is all very very terrifying, and um, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I I know you have some books you would like to promote where people can learn a lot more in depth about all of these things. So why why don't you tell the the nice people watching who are crying and terrified uh, where they can follow you and uh, and then the become books. more terrified, and become more terrified. So. Um, you can find me on X, although uh, I'm 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 not a great poster. I'm I'm more of a lurker when it comes to uh, X. Uh, you can find uh, all of my CSBA uh, reports uh, online at, at uh, uh, csbaonline.org. Uh, my uh, latest book, as was mentioned, was uh, Mao's Army Goes to Sea. It looks at the origin of uh, Chinese sea power, including its many. Uh, offshore campaigns that are, will be that are and will be relevant to the Taiwan scenario. Okay, maybe we can end on a note of, if not hope, of of potential action. What would you recommend that the U.S. do now to kind of deal with this scenario we find ourselves in with China? Buy his books. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. So. Yeah. You know. I mean. I. I painted a pretty stark and depressing picture, um, but I do think that the United States has uh, possesses um, several uh, enduring advantages. I think the United States will likely remain an innovative power when it comes to the most uh, cutting edge technologies. I think we need to, uh, you know, continue to invest in those uh, enduring advantages. Uh, the United States has an enduring advantage when it comes to its allies and friends. The United States boasts a constellation of very high quality friends, not only in Asia, but around the world uh, that um, it can leverage. And this will be a very powerful tool to isolate and also counterbalance um, um, China. Um, I would add that, uh, you know, India, of course, is a very important part of that equation. And I think we need to, in the military domain, I do think that we need to focus again, on our enduring competitive advantages. I think we need to, for example, maintain our undersea dominance, which uh, China is increasingly seeking to challenge and overturn. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we also need to think about our own asymmetric uh, approaches. So, you know, if, 
if China is using uh, an, an A to AD strategy, anti-access air denial approach, uh, we can turn the tables on them and deploy our own uh, A to AD systems, uh, both on American soil, but also on allied soil uh, to impose costs uh, on the Chinese military. So uh, all hope is not lost. Um, time is short uh, to be sure, but um, we, we still have these enduring competitive advantages and operational concepts that we can take advantage to turn things around. Thank you very much for your time and joining us today. I won't be sleeping tonight. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but this was fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. You know, I really, after listening, after this podcast, I, I really like that the specter of nuclear annihilation really hasn't left the world. It's just, you know, still there. Well, I, I feel like it's not necessarily the nuclear annihilation that we have to worry about, but just the conventional warfare annihilation. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the, the entire world ending in a nuclear fire is still on the table. Yep. On, on the plus side, if that happens, then you don't have to worry about what happens in the aftermath of the war. Like Toshi was talking about, like, what happens if, you know, all the bases are destroyed? Yeah, and I guess we US... don't need to think about, like, how do we maintain security in the Asia Pacific if we're, you know, mutants wandering the wastelands? Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Always you know, the optimist shell. You know what's even worse? If the U.S. government bans TikTok. <laughs> uh, that's a good point, because that's, that, you know. That's what I learned on TikTok. <laughs> We're boned. <laughs> All of our throbbing shipping lanes. <laughs> Done. I'm just imagining a world where there's only TikTok and Timu. <laughs> that's, that's the only source of information. What would ancient Rome do? Well, they collapsed. I guess they didn't figure it out. <laughs> hmm. Destroy themselves from within? Convert to Christianity? Split in half? Okay, so does the Byzantine Empire count as part of ancient Rome? No. No, because that's its own separate glorious Christian empire. So that was the empire that Constantine converted to Christianity, right? Well, no, it was the whole thing. thing. Okay. And like historically, there was always kind of a divide between Western and Eastern Rome, um, but it like actually, actually split in two eventually, later after. But the Byzantines survived. For a little longer, yeah. So are you saying we should try to become the Byzantine Empire? No, because then, like, you lose to the Turks. Yeah, but that's our great-great-great-grandchildren's problem. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Hey, you know, it was a bad idea giving China all that money for decades. But But that was our, you know ancestors' children's and grandchildren's problem. That's right. They, so, they got money. I didn't even money. take that long. I didn't really. Their ancestors. They're still alive. If we were alive. If, if you have children at like age 15 or something. It worked it out be... for Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Lived to 92. Life of debauchery. Extreme wealth. Millions dead at his feet. And he died before it came back to haunt him. Yeah. Yeah. Never met justice. I think, you know, his death was actually a blow to the CCP. They're obviously trying to find their next Henry Kissinger. Oh, I wonder if there is anyone who could fill that void. I think the CCP has maybe decided it's Graham Allison, the Harvard professor that met Xi Jinping along with all of the CEOs a oh, couple yeah. weeks ago. And, yeah. We're going to think he's the big bad, and then he turns out it's just a clone, and then somehow Kissinger has returned. He pulls off his mask, and it's Kissinger all along. I'm thinking of Star Wars. Oh, okay. I think about ancient Roman Star Wars every day. <laughs> mm. See, I was actually thinking Scooby-Doo, you know, where the bad guy. Yes, that's also what I was thinking of, too. Yeah. You were thinking of Scooby-Doo. I was we have thinking of Scooby-Doo, yes. We have different pop culture references. I mean, it is a meme, that Scooby-Doo like, it's also yeah. a mean that like somehow Palpatine has returned. Yeah, I I never really got into Star Wars. That's for the best. <laughs> That's for the best. Ah, there's only two good movies. 
Uh huh. And which movies are they? A New Hope and. Uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, there's this there's this meeting going on between Biden and. Uh, well, we got a meeting with uh, Japan and the Philippines. Right. So this is actually what so she was talking about, right? The leveraging friendships um, of people who also don't like the CCP. Friendship is what will save us. The real friends. <laughs> are, are the friends we no, no. made along the way? <laughs> no, I messed it up. It should be like diplomatic partnerships. <laughs> yeah. The real nuclear deterrent is the friends we made along the way. Okay, oh, that, that would have been way yeah, better. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, my brain just. I'm tired, okay? Yeah. It's the eclipse. I stared too long into the sun. <laughs> Actually, I couldn't because where I was, it was completely cloudy. Oh, okay. Um, well, the total eclipse of my heart. Uh, don't look at that. Don't look at my heart. <laughs> You'll go blind. Um, because your heart is so radiant with love and light. Uh, this reminds me, we need to stream Fallout on our gaming channel. Okay. So for the surprisingly large uh, number of you who do watch yeah. both channels, thank I mean, you. Come on, a game set in a uh, nuclear wasteland set after a U.S.-China nuclear war. Are they making a TV show out of that? They are. Yeah. It's releasing soon, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then we can actually see like what the aftermath would look like. Beautiful. Scrounging around for bottle caps and rat away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, if there is a war between China and the U.S., it will end like this podcast. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Thank you for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley John. And I'm Matt Kanesta. We'll see you next time. And now I'm thinking about how Ye I'm thinking about how Yates wrote a lot about the Byzantine Empire. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah. You gotta do some reading. Mm hmm I lend you I have a I have a book of his poetry. Ooh. Shelly and I are sharing poetry. <laughs> and because, I'm over here whimpering. <laughs> well, because the real nuclear deterrent is the friends. Since we, we made, made along the way, way, yes. Put that on a t-shirt. Yeah, I was going to say, we should make a shirt. <laughs> I'll make a shirt. Buy the shirt. Buy the shirt.